Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r, &R Law Group. We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona, and today we're talking about Glenn Maxwell. She's still in trial. Day 8, government's case in chief, is still moving along quite nicely, and in fact, it's moving very quickly. They may be done tomorrow. What are you talking about? How are they going to wrap up their entire case with four victims in two weeks. They were telling us this was going to go well into January. We may have this whole thing buttoned up before Christmas. And so we've got a lot to talk about, which means we might have our very last victim tomorrow. And we've got a lot of interesting rulings about some of these victims that took place today. And so we're going to have to do a little bit of a rethinking about some of the people that we've been talking about because the judge came out and gave us some interesting rulings this morning. So we'll get into that. We've got a ton of new exhibits that came out from uh, the day prior's testimony from day seven, uh, a lot of these are photographs showing Galen and Jeffrey Epstein, you know, sort of as a romantic couple. Galen Maxwell and her defense team, they've been trying to paint this whole situation as though Galen Maxwell's this victim. Jeffrey Epstein was the monster. Galen's just this nice little sweetheart who got kind of caught up in this whole thing, and she's a victim. These photographs tell a different story. And so as we go through the show today, be asking yourselves, is this a picture of a villain, meaning Galen Maxwell, or a victim, as the defense attorney would have you believe? The prosecution wants you to believe that she's a villain. Did the picture show that? Let's see. So we'll analyze whether they're partners or not. We've got a lot to dig into in the way of uh, photographs of Galen Maxwell giving Jeffrey Epstein a massage on an airplane. Ugh. We have to talk about it because these photographs are a real thing and we're going to get into that we have a juror who had transportation problems this morning we've got reporter one addy ads he's on twitter and he was giving us some details about the proceedings before they took place this morning and then we dive right into the testimony so we're still in the introduction here i haven't even gotten into the day's testimony yet can you believe that but we're going to hear from Sean. This is Carolyn's boyfriend. We heard from Carolyn yesterday. Her boyfriend, Sean, came out and testified a little bit more about what he knows. And then we're going to hear from a, a lot of different uh, former employees, people from the uh, Human Resources Department over at mar lago who I think is still working there. And then we have a woman named Nicole Hesse. She is somebody who worked at Epstein's Palm Beach residence, and she's going to help connect the dots between a couple other names that are very important in this trial. Joe Nearman, Good Logic, is going to stop on by. His channel is also on YouTube, so if you're watching that here, check the description, and you can tag it and go over to his channel. He's there in person. He's got some amazing updates, had an amazing update yesterday, and we'll talk and hear from him. And then we wrap up the day with David Rogers. David Rogers is Epstein's second pilot. We already heard from Visosky, who was the first pilot, right on in the opening of the entire trial and now we're hearing from pilot number two and so as you can see boy we've got a lot to get to if you want to be a part of the show place to do that is over at watching the watchers .com. there's a form looks just like this if you are a member over there you've got access to it you also have access to our mind map which we'll get to in a minute but you can check out this channel if you're looking for clips of the show if you want to rewind or share a different segment or say hey what did kate say or what did carolyn say or what did jane say then you can go back to this channel robert cruller esq clips and so we've got a lot to dive into so let's just do it shall we in day seven of the Galen Maxwell trial, we heard from an FBI special agent named Kimberly Metter. Remember, we talked about her yesterday. Of course, right now we're in day eight, but a lot of the exhibits that came out from day seven are now public. And these are being leaked all over the internet. They're not leaked. I mean, they're publicly available. I should say they're being published all over the internet. This was a court sketch from one of the photographs, one of the romantic embraces between Galen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. What a nice couple. Oh, isn't that sweet? And so we get a lot of these photographs are now out and publicly available. And so we're going to go through some of them and we're going to ask ourselves a very important question. Number one, is it something where we're seeing Galen Maxwell as a villain, where she is the person who is responsible for a lot of the horrendous things we've seen, or is she, in fact, the victim? This is a big issue. This has been one of the themes that the defense has been hinting at. We've talked about their opening theme, memory, money, and manipulation. What's the manipulation? Well, it's the idea that Galen Maxwell is a villain 
who's being manipulated? Well, the other victims are. Jane, Carolyn, Kate, all of them are being manipulated against Galen Maxwell, who's also a victim. So the defense is saying that she is in fact a victim. She's part of this whole entire victimhood crew. Everybody's a victim of Jeffrey Epstein. Whereas the prosecution is saying, nope, these two people are partners. They are two peas in a pod. They are in cahoots. They are yin and yang. And so as we go through these photographs, we're asking ourselves, why were all of these admitted? Why, why are we going through these photographs? Why are the prosecutors spending so much time on this? It's to answer that question. Villain or victim. If the prosecution, if the, in, in the defense, if their closing argument is just wrapped around this idea that Galen Maxwell is a victim and she was dragged along kicking and screaming throughout this entire ordeal, they're going to remind the jurors about all these photographs. And so let's take a look and, and see what you think about these. We're going to start with the redacted photos. Remember yesterday when we were going through the Palm Beach residence that we saw a lot of this? We saw photographs after photographs just spread all over the place, and many of them were redacted. You can see right here, a lot of faces. Somebody's driving this car, redacted photo, somebody sitting in his lap. Who is that? Don't know. We've got Jeffrey and Galen kissing. Here we have some architecture photos of a couple residences or you know, uh, uh, locations. Everything else on the table is blacked out. So it could be you know, names uh, or, or, or you know, famous people, could be family members, could be victims, who knows. We see this though, same thing here. Another close-up, Government Exhibit 252R. We see almost everything has been redacted. When the detectives and the crime scene investigator, when they turn the corner and they go back into this closet, we see this exhibit, 282R. Everything on that wall has been redacted. Kind of a weird wall behind a door. You open up a door and you have a wall of certificates that are just sort of hanging there, I guess. Not sure what that is about. And we can't really zoom in and see what's going on in this photograph, but some sort of a drawing with a diagram separating two people, sort of a maybe a small child, or actually it looks like a skull and bones. Skull and bones, the distance between the skull and bones and something else, weird stuff going on. Yesterday, we also looked at this part of the residence. We saw all the, the names of a bunch of different books up here. We saw, it looks like, Peddlers. The Peddler is up there. We have By the Wayside. We've got something by Murdoch. Uh, Deceit is a very appropriate book here. People are taking a closer look and analyzing that. The bigger issue, which we talked about yesterday, of course, is this box full of hard drives. We know that Epstein was burning a lot of these photographs that said, you know, uh, Selena AV photo shoot or whoever that is, you know, on these discs. And he had just, you know, uh, this is back in the 1990s. And so he's just got, you know, huge uh, buckets that are filled with CDs and then runs out of CD space. So now he's got to turn over to the hard drives and that's what it looks like. And so if you recall yesterday, big portion of the testimony that we reviewed was photographs, 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 and is very frustrating, even for the people who were there, apparently, because they couldn't see a lot of this stuff. And it was, you know, sort of being uh, uh, kept off the public viewer uh, viewing room or not available to be seen easily. Anyways, these are the photographs that we're talking about. So you'll see this lovely couple. We've got Jeffrey Epstein and we've got Galen Maxwell. A couple of little lovebirds out there just taking a stroll out in the snowy meadows. You've got Jeffrey Epstein here in a uh, full red jumpsuit. And this looks like they're kind of partners, doesn't it? Looks like they're in a nice couple, uh, you know, kind of in a nice warm relationship. Uh, sweetie, let's go out for a, a nice stroll. That sounds great, honey. All right, perfect. And so he's got her, his hand right on her belly and they just look like a happy couple. We see that Jeffrey's in a full red jumpsuit and we see this one's a little bit more romantic. Don't know who's taking these photographs. Looks like it's some time ago. And so, you know, this isn't the era where everybody's got a camera on their smartphone. This is, you know, somebody's, I don't know if they're taking photographs or Somebody's just having fun, but it looks like a couple to me. I mean, I don't know about what you have to say about that, but yeah, it looks kind of like he's into her and like she's into him. Body language, right? He's okay. Hey, baby, what's up? And it just continues on. We see another photograph. Looks like a nice couple riding around. She's not being, you know, uh, you know carried around in chains or anything like that. Looks pretty voluntary to me, riding a motorcycle. Here they are. Looks like flying an aircraft, and so she's all buckled up. 
Don't know exactly where they're going. She's got a little bit of a buzz cut. This looks maybe like it's a little bit more recent. This is her on a boat, another government exhibit. And so they're showing, like, this is not just gratuitous, right? This is not just going through photographs just because people want to peer inside and say, well, what's going on with Galen and Jeffrey? This is a court of law. This isn't a tabloid somewhere. And this is what they're showing. They're, they were hanging out. Galen Maxwell was on his boat. They were literally, you know, just putzing around the water. She's lounging all over the place. She was integral to this entire scheme. Here they are at a tux, you know, gala, whatever. And I don't know what she's doing or what she's wearing. But ladies and gentlemen of the juror, here they are again. Not an isolated incident. They even have a plus one. They have a real good boy in there. We're the only good boy in this photograph. They're out there and they're taking a photograph. And they're hanging out again. Nice outfits. He's got a turtleneck. Got some ear protection on. Might be out doing some shooting. Don't know. But it's couple stuff. They're out there venturing around the world. Okay, we have another one. They're out visiting. This is Exhibit 333. And you can see he's smiling. She's smiling. Looks like they're a nice couple. Okay, this is her on an aircraft now. Now we're going to start to bounce around a little bit. She's flying on the aircraft. Government Exhibit 337. Got a good old USA flag on her arm. Looks like a little bit older photo here in 317. And so you can see some of the, you know, some of these are dated. Some of these are a little bit newer. Some of these are older. And so they're showing this is consistent. Over decades, these two had a relationship. Flying all over the place, traveling on boats, everywhere you turn, these two are together. And that mirrors a lot of the testimony that we heard. We heard from Juan Alessi, you know, lady of the house. They were always together. They were inseparable. And the photographs tell the same story. Here's another one. We've got 318. She's hugging and kissing on Epstein. We have another one. Don't know where this is. He's got a big hat on his head. Don't know what that is. Maybe they're over in uh, you know, the Ukraine. Not, who knows? Government Exhibit 304. We have special trips. We have special poses. This is Epstein now. And Galen taking a photograph in the exact same spot that apparently the queen took a photograph. Here she is pictured with a cabin with her friend Margaret Rhodes. They're sitting in the same sun exposed spot that Maxwell and Epstein enjoyed. Right. So they're going out and taking photographs and doing all sorts of coupley stuff. Very cute. Here's another photograph. Now this, you know, Jeffrey, this is, looks like a little bit more uh, recent photograph. And so he's sort of checking out of the relationship at this point. He's like, yeah, I'm on the phone. I'm trying to schedule my next massage. Can you just leave? Yeah, I'll take the photo. All right. Are we done? All right. Yeah. So anyways, as I was saying, he's busy, but Galen still wants the photo. You know how that goes. Here's another one. He's kind of over it. Body language is changing a little bit. Sort of saw that over here. But these two, pretty coupley, aren't they? Then we get to the aircraft photographs. Now, these are the photographs that uh, a lot of people are raising their eyebrows over because it is uh, interesting. You see a little bit of uh, exposure from Galen, but because this is a family show, we're going to use the VOM emoji to clean this up a little bit. And so you can see what this photograph is. This is submitted in front of the jurors. Now, if you're a defense attorney, you sort of make a, a different argument from this. You know, these photographs are happy couples. Uh, this photograph is uh, not so much, you know, maybe it's jokey or they're having fun. They're you know, they're having fun with this because she's putting his foot in her chest, in other words. And uh, they zoom in on this one and it looks like now Epstein has the camera. OK, so Epstein has the camera and he is this sort of like a joke thing, like a humiliation thing, like rub my disgusting feet or what? Or they're just joking around. You know, they're having a couple cocktails. They're having fun. They're a lovely couple. And uh, it's very, you know, it's just a fun day on their airplane. Who knows? Here's another one. And so now, the, you know, my question, of course, is who's taking the photograph on this one? Actually, who's taking the photo? So Epstein's taking this photo. This photo, somebody else is taking. Epstein's got this one. Somebody else is taking this photo. Now, Galen's sort of opening up a little bit. Now, because this is so horrendous and this is a family show, here is a sketch of uh, 
This is the PG-13 version of it. And it's a pretty good sketch. I mean, she hit that pretty good, right? Like, that's the photo. That's the sketch. Pretty good. Very talented. Okay. And then we see somebody else is on that airplane. This is a French modeling scout. This guy is Jean-Luc Brunel over from France. And uh, he apparently has come under scrutiny. I was charged by French prosecutors back in 2020. So the French are going after this fellow or, you know, I haven't followed up on what that story is, but Government Exhibit uh, 343, you can see now Maxwell is joking. Hey, Jean-Luc, look at what I've got over here. And he's like, oh, not, not a fan of that. No, thanks. And so now he's been charged in France and, you know, Epstein's kind of jokey over it. So it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really make heads or tails any of this stuff, right? You could... They're just joking around. Just a couple of, uh, 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 you know, knuckleheads up there. Very sexual everywhere they go. And um, they're partners. But why is Epstein laughing at her flashing a friend? You know, I don't know. Is that something that you're cool with your significant other doing? I don't know. So we have this photograph. And, you know, apparently when uh, this photograph was out, a court reporter or somebody or a sketch artist was able to get a glance at what Galid looked like. This is what she looked like in court today. So she had the, the little bit of the squinty eye going on. She's looking at the sketch artist thinking, yeah, you saw that. What'd you think about that? Or she's embarrassed. I don't know what that look is. It kind of reminded me of this guy, this young man. Kind of, right? Like I just kind of got busted. I don't know. All right. So, uh, you know, that was that meme where he's like, you looking at me? Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. Glenn busted. So uh, massaging Epstein's feet. And those were just the exhibits that were released yesterday. Then we get to testimony in Glenn Maxwell trial day eight. Now we see Glenn walking into the courtroom and we're going to have to deal with a couple of issues regarding these victims. Remember, there were four victims that were named in the original indictment, and there's been a lot of back and forth about these victims, and we're gonna have to break that down. So before we do, let's take a look at what the scene looked like in the courtroom. So once again, Galen Maxwell is being uh, joined by two US Marshals, and so they escort her in as they do every day, sort of like you know the men in black or the women in black, in other words, as they open the door, make sure that she doesn't uh, springboard out into a, a, a Israeli helicopter. And so we've got the, uh, Maxwell here. And as I say this, I say this time and time again, time and time again. But here, body language, hugs. As soon as she walks into the court, everybody sees hugs, 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 hugs. Touching, touching, touching. She is not a monster. She's a nice woman is what she's trying to convey. And it's every day. It's every stinking day, right? They're, they make a very big point of it. And so she gets in. And remember, we were talking about these various victims. And remember, what's been so difficult about this trial is that we're using pseudonyms and we can't really identify who's who and you know, put names to faces and make connections between all the various people. And so as we were listening to testimony back when Kate was testifying, this was on Monday, the 6th. We were reading this from Adam Classfield over at lawandcrime.com. He's the editor over there. And this was when Kate was coming in. And he said, OK, the judge came out and said this specifically. The judge says the next anticipated witness is Kate. She's one of the witnesses against Maxwell. The defense was arguing that she was over the age of consent. And so there are arguments about the scope of her testimony. So then there's a back and forth. Something happens. And Judge Nathan comes out and says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, talking about Kate, quote, and this is being reported by Adam Klasfeld, who's there, says, quote, I instruct you that the witness is not a victim of the crimes charged in the indictment. And you're going, what? I remember reading that. We talked about it on Monday. Okay. And so Klasfeld says, okay, so even though Kate was one of the four accusers, I'm going to now, I guess, refer to her as a witness now. Because I thought she was one of the victims, but judge said, no, um, she's not. I'm instructing you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury that she's not actually a victim of the crimes in the indictment. 
You know, what is going on here? Okay, so then Nathan instructs the jury that Kate is not a victim of the crimes that were charged in the indictment. The government has been instructed not to testify about the details of any contact with Epstein of a certain variety. And that's weird. So why is she testifying uh, anonymously, pseudo-anonymously using Kate? And she's going to come out and she's going to be kind of a key government witness, but they're not going to be able to consider her the victim of any of the crimes in the indictment. So why is Kate testifying at all then? Well, we suspected it was because of the grooming analysis. Remember when we were talking about this on the mind map, this was a screenshot from a prior version of the mind map. The mind map is uh, still growing every single day we add to it. But previously when we were doing our analysis, we put Kate down here, if you recall, down here in the corner. We didn't list her as one of the minor victims, why? Because we just read this. It said, I instruct you she's not a victim of the crimes in the I- charged in the indictment. So even though she was one of the original four accusers, she's not a, vic- a victim. This is according to Judge Nathan. So we couldn't put her over there. But, I, but guess what? Turns out, I think she is actually a victim here. She's just not somebody that kind of counts. Okay, so now that we understand this, let's take a listen and see, or let's take a look and see what happened today in court. So now we're having this battle. Where is Kate? We get this weird instruction about her. She kind of testifies as though she was a victim, but in the indictment, you know, she kind of doesn't fit in there under the the facts of this case. And so now we we fast forward and now we're having a a new conversation about Kate. And now we've got uh, uh, Annie, who's coming up here soon, testifying tomorrow. And we're going to have a similar conversation. So attorneys on both sides are filing motions back and forth. Are these actual victims? Are they victims of certain uh, remember, we were talking about dates of birth and age of consent and birth date, birth certificate stipulations and all that stuff. If somebody's over the age of consent, then this is no longer a, a conspiracy involving a minor, at least to that victim. Because they're not actually a minor, are they? And they are charged in the indictment as a minor. This isn't about adult you know, abuse. It's about minor abuse. So if, if it's different than what's in the indictment, doesn't fit. That's, that's a dismissal of the charge. They can't prove it. So we get back here today. This is Adam Klasfeld again, keeping us updated. Says Judge Nathan is about to rule on her limiting instruction about Galen Maxwell's last accuser. That was Kate. She said that Epstein made contact with her in New Mexico. Uh-oh, guess what? New Mexico has different age of consent laws. So the judge comes out and says, all right. I'm going to tell the jurors that any of that contact that took place in New Mexico is not illegal sexual activity. See the judge saying that. Not illegal sexual activity. So this is going to be for the last accuser. I'm sorry, this is for Annie. This is not for Kate. This is for the last witness who's coming up tomorrow. Classfield continues. He said, this is a less sweeping instruction than the other one provided for Kate, whom the judge told the jury was not a victim of the crimes. So, unlike Kate, the judge says, Annie is an alleged victim of the crimes charged in the indictment. So now we've got four different victims who have been named but we have some that are like full victims and some that are like half full victims. Let's see if we can break down what's going on. Kate was 17 at the time, above the age of consent in all the jurisdictions. The witness Annie was 16 at the time, which was the age of consent in Mexico. But prosecutors are now saying that she was groomed in other jurisdictions. So how can we break this down? Let's take a look at the mind map because we're going to want to take a look at how this is working. If we remember that in the indictment, if we go over to the important documents, we've got this superseding indictment and we've got here all the different charges that are delineated out. We've got conspiracy to traffic, minor victims, one, two, three, and four, minor victim number one, enticement, again, conspiracy to transport, one, two, three, and four. And you can see different victims are connected with different charges. So if one of these victims is not actually a minor, well, then they weren't actually, you know, they can't fit within the purview of the indictment. And so those charges cannot, cannot stay. 
So in other words, if Kate was not actually a minor, well, then how could she be somebody who is a victim of trafficking of a minor or of a transportation of a minor or of a conspiracy to transport a minor? She can't. So the only thing that maybe they could bring her in on would be like a conspiracy to traffic or something else. And remember that these perjury charges, they're also not being charged in this trial. This is not about that. So it almost looks like when we go back over to the victims now, Kate is kind of not really a victim. And Annie is also kind of not really a victim. Because as we see from the judge, the, the activity involving, you know, any, any physical activities is not illegal in New Mexico. That was the judge's ruling. So you kind of only have now sort of two full victims. Two victims were everywhere you look. They were, in fact, under the age. And you've got two victims that don't have any limiting instructions on them. Otherwise, the judge is limiting the, the, the testimony. Annie was 16. She was groomed, so you can, get, you can use her on the grooming, but not on the sexual activity. It was not illegal, like the government charged. So she's already been found basically not guilty of, those, of that. According to the judge. It was not illegal activity as charged in the indictment. As you saw it in there, incorrect. Interesting stuff. Okay. Then trial actually starts. Inner city press reporting as usual. Nathan comes out, says, uh-oh, we're going to have to wait for a juror. They've got a train issue. Delayed. I'm going to step off the bench. Clerk says, all rise, and the juror finally shows up 45 minutes later. Ugh, don't you hate that when a train is late? And you're 45 minutes late? I mean, a 45-minute late train? Don't they come like every eight minutes or something? Anyways, we want to take a moment to pay our respects to those people out there who are boots on the ground in New York City covering this trial and working their hearts out. I want to pay particular attention to this fellow here, one Addy Ads over on Twitter. He's working his butt off. If you're not following him, you should follow him. He has updates. He posts these two-minute updates multiple times a day. Very, very good follow. Very good takes. But he gave us an update. Said Kevin Maxwell seems like he's avoiding the media today. And he wants to support those people who are there. So do I. And so he was there. And he's been there every day. And he said, man, we got started really late today. And he gave us an update on how things look from his perspective. Here's what he had to say. Okay, guys, I know people were worried because I wasn't tweeting this morning. Uh, but, uh, again, I did. Had trouble sleeping last night, so I had a lot of trouble waking up this morning. But, again, some someone claimed that some woman from the public came and turned off the sound uh, when I went into the overflow room this morning. So I got there, and they hadn't even started yet. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, on top of that, I think uh, Mr. Maxwell is avoiding me. Uh, he snuck out before lunch, at least an hour or so before. So, and he actually went the opposite way. Uh, the media door is kind of right around the corner here, um, over there. So, uh, looks like he's trying to avoid the media maybe a little bit more. So we'll, we'll see if we can get him out uh, leaving the trial uh, later this afternoon. Haven't heard if they're going to do a press conference uh, at all after today. Uh, but again, Maxwell did not hear anything back. <laughs> from the authorities about improving Maxwell's, uh, his sister's uh, state of condition uh, in prison, which uh, is not surprising. Again, that's par for the course. U.S. prison system needs to be uh, reformed, uh, to say the least. Uh, but again, uh, she's not getting special treatment like uh, her brother seems to uh, want. Uh, and uh, I noticed I wasn't the only one that was late today. Uh, right before lunch, uh, maybe an hour or so before, a bunch of people came in. Uh, so that was that was interesting. Uh, you know, but again, I'm one of only a few people I can count on one hand that's been here every single day covering the whole trial, right? Uh, and uh, I'm only human, a one-man show. Uh, I did see Maxwell Live Tracker. He got their account terminated. Don't feel too bad about that. Uh, again, they were just drifting off uh, what I've been doing, what uh, these other reporters here who are actually doing stuff have been doing. Uh, and uh, he just grifted, switched his uh, Twitter profile from the Rittenhouse trial to the Maxwell trial. Uh, again, those people aren't even here. 
Posobiec's not even here. He's uh, spreading disinformation. Uh, all those big YouTube guys, Robert Gruller, he does great work, uh, I know, but you're not even here, bro. I'm here. Addy Eds is here. Uh, shout out to Inner City Press. Shout out to Joe Nierman, who's, uh, who's also doing awesome work as well. Very few people here actually doing on the ground boots work. So try to support. Stay frosty. We'll see everybody uh, after the break. All right. So one Addy ads on Twitter. All love for him. Really appreciative of his work and Joe and Inner City. You know, there's a there's a lot of guys who are really putting in a lot of time. It is grueling work to sit there and take notes and listen to a trial all day. It's it's really you know trial. When we condense it here. We sort of synthesize it and talk about the highlights, but it's a lot of dead time and a lot of waiting and sitting around there. I mean, it's a lot of work. And so guys like him and Joe and Inner City, they're there every day. And so my hat's off to them, all love to them. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you know, ho hopefully they continue to do it and we can continue to, to sort of boost their signal when we can. Uh, and, you know, and if, if anybody, you know, if one Addy ads or anybody else has any issues with me, you know, using some of their stuff, just let me know and I'll stop. No issues about that at all. I would just rather sort of uh, re, re uh, boost your signal rather than read from Bloomberg or from Washington Post or something like that. So all love. I hope, I hope you don't take any offense to it. Uh, I, I appreciate it. So, all right. So we've got his report. We've got a look inside the courtroom. Here's Galen Maxwell. Don't know who she's talking to over here. And we've got a... Uh, uh, a starting line of testimony here from this person named Janine. This is Janine Gill. New York Post and Ben Fuerhard, Tamir Lapin, they're over there reporting. Uh, we've got, they're telling us that court has started after a slight delay. Same thing that Addy just communicated. Prosecutors have called their next witness, and it's going to be Janine Gill. And because she's sort of not a public figure, not too much that I could find on her. He is the director of human resources at Mar-a-Lago, or she is. And she's expected to authenticate records related to Virginia Roberts Guffrey. And Roberts Guffrey, Virginia Guffrey, of course, was the same woman who sued Maxwell and Epstein. And as part of that defamation lawsuit, there was a deposition that took place. And Guffrey sort of was responsible for bringing some of those perjury charges that reappeared against Galen Maxwell. And so this person is sort of laying down some foundation because we need records related to Virginia Roberts Guffrey for other purposes. And so that's kind of all she gets brought in for. Right? Not, not too much there that is ultra compelling. But we can see here that they're also making a connection between Guffrey and her father, Sky Roberts. So remember, it's Virginia Roberts Guffrey. So she kind of hyphenated her last name. And so when Janine Gill from Mar-a-Lago comes in, that's Trump's place. Trump's name keeps coming up in this. I and mean, everybody's very excited when that happens, thinking that somehow he's going to be implicated. Haven't seen anything to that effect yet, but a lot of people in the media excited every time anything in his orbit comes into fruition. Gill testified on Wednesday that a man named Sky Roberts was hired to work there. This was back in 2000. In other words, Sky Roberts went to work for Mar-a-Lago when when it was the year 2000. He was a maintenance worker, made 12 bucks an hour, and prosecutors submitted a birth certificate showing that Guffrey's father is Sky Roberts. Sky Roberts, the worker for Mar-a-Lago, Roberts Guffrey, the daughter of Sky Roberts. Okay, so you can see the connection here. Testimony continues. Inner City Press says, the assistant U.S. attorney, I believe it's Maureen Comey, she comes in and says, how long have you worked at Mar-a-Lago? And Janine Gill says, 15 years, long time. So they go into exhibit, it's 823R, it's redacted for the public. So they'll publish it, but it's going to be redacted. It's a personal action notice. It's the hiring of her father, Sky Roberts, April 2000. See how this testimony goes. They get him in, they're going to be able to now connect him to... Guffrey, and maybe get some of those records in. Inner City tells us, yep, that's what they wanted to establish, the hiring of Sky Roberts. Then Bobby Sternheim comes out, this is Galen Maxwell's defense lawyer, and says, all right there, Janine. So, I mean, you can, you, you can be here and authenticate this record, but you don't know anything specifically about the hiring, do you? Correct. I don't know anything specific about that particular hire. This was 2000. It was 21 years ago. I've only been there for 15 years. Don't know anything about that particular hiring decision. 
No further questions. Next witness. We get this gentleman. Sean comes out. Sean is the boyfriend or was the boyfriend of Carolyn. Carolyn, we heard from yesterday. And so because there's that relationship there, they're going to continue to testify pseudo not anonymously. And so here is Sean once again in court identifying different photographs. Here is Jeffrey Epstein. Testimony continues. Judge Nathan starts it. Okay, this witness, ladies and gentlemen, is only going to testify as Sean. This is to protect the anonymity of the prior witness, Carolyn. And I'm reminding the sketch artist, no exact likeness in any of the drawings. Witness stands up. I'm Sean, S-H-A-W-N. That sealed exhibit has my full name. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that. Comey says, okay, Sean, how old are you? How far did you go in school? Tell me about what you do with your life. Well, I'm 38 years old. I've completed some college and I'm a salesman. And what was the name of your first girlfriend, if we were riding the clock all the way back? Carolyn, he says. I was 17 years old, and she was 14. We dated back then for four or five years. She worked at Arby's, and she also worked for Epstein. And how did she meet Epstein? Through Virginia Roberts. And we just heard from the preceding witness who talked about Marilago and Sky Roberts. Comey says, what's the difference between Palm Beach and West Palm Beach? Sean says, uh, money. Maxwell's lawyer scream, objection, you can't say that. Sustained, implying that people in Palm Beach or West Palm, somebody's got more money than somebody else. Comey says, did you go to Palm Beach much? Sean says, no. I didn't have enough money to buy anything in the gas station there bunch of rich people out there in Palm Beach. Prosecutor Comey says, all right, well, how long did Carolyn stay in Epstein's house when she went over there? Sean said an hour or, you know, an hour or five minutes. And when she would go over there, can you tell me, you know, how are those sessions set up? Uh, Sean said, well, they would call my phone, Sarah and some lady with a foreign accent. They would give me a buzz. One was English, uh, one was almost French. I'd get these weird people calling, okay. And they'd set up the session. Direct exam continues. When you were dating Carolyn, did she mention anyone else? She did, but she couldn't pronounce the first name of that person. Wonder who that could be. Probably Jihizlani, who's here talking about her. Did she get a gift? She did, yeah. She got stuff from FedEx, things like lingerie and a movie, stuff from New York. And did you go to Epstein's with anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Melissa and Amanda Laszlo also went. And how old was Amanda when you saw her go to Epstein's house? Sean says 15. Lawyers scream out, objection. He doesn't know that. He can't prove that. Sure, that was sustained. How old was she? I don't know. I guess it was it was uh, overruled. How old was Melissa? Oh no, this what this one goes in. How old was Melissa? Okay, when she went to Epstein's house, sixteen. She came out with one hundred dollar bills. And Sean, I got to ask you this before you go: Were you arrested in Louisiana? Sean says, yeah. For what? Well, possession of meth. And a felon in possession of a firearm. Fortunately, now I'm recovered and now I'm a salesman. So, drawing the sting, as we say, getting those bad facts out, knowing the defense is going to come out and say, you're a meth addict, aren't you? And you're also somebody, when you were a convicted felon were in possession of a firearm and you got charged with a crime for that also, right? So Comey's going to just get that out of the way right now because it's going to look a lot worse if they talk about it and she didn't talk about it. So then we get very brief cross-examination from Jeff Paleyuka, the G is silent like lasagna. He's out now. All right. Pag says, Sean, you went to Epstein's house in 2002, right? Yeah. And it was Sarah who called you and gave you her name, right? That's right. 
talking about a name, Sarah. Sarah called you and gave you her name, huh? Paleyuka says, and you met the government, for example, in 2002, and you said the accent was French, didn't you? Well, I mean, Sean said it was foreign. And that's the testimony that we get. It wraps up after that. Now we see, hey, Rob. as we continue on, that some of the pieces are going to connect a little bit further. But let's take a quick look at that mind map, shall we? Because we have this person here called Sarah. And Sarah was a name that we have heard previously when we were looking at that Jeffrey Epstein non-prosecution agreement. And so let's pull this puppy up. If we take a look back again at these minor victims, of which some are not actually. In fact, Kate doesn't seem like she's a minor victim at all. Neither does Annie. We got Carolyn. Carolyn is in this relationship with this fella called Sean. And he's talking about somebody called Sarah, who used to call and set these things up. Well, remember, if we take a look at Jeffrey Epstein and some of his other victims, we've got some other names that have been floating around in here. But if we go back to that 2007 non-prosecution agreement, you see this name right here? Sarah Kellen. Oh, that Sarah name just popped up. Wonder who that was. That was one of Epstein's assistants back in this non-prosecution agreement. She's listed right here. Sarah Kellen, Adriana Ross, Leslie Groff, and Nadia Marcinkova. Now, take a look at these names. This has all been public as part of the government's non-prosecution agreement. We see four names on here. They're all listed. I just showed you the document. Because Mr. Paleyuka is going to talk about this again. And you can see some people are popping in here. We got Jack's in the house, guest seven's here, guest three's here. If you want to go in and dig around in this, you're welcome to do that. If you're a member at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, you can come and click into all this and zoom in and zoom out and do whatever you needed to do. But if you're taking a look, you're going to see we've got Sarah Kellen and three other women listed here as named co-conspirators. This is going to come back up in Maxwell's case. So when we're talking to Sean, who is the boyfriend of, of Carolyn back then, we can see that Sarah Kellen was calling Carolyn as Jeffrey Epstein's assistant. We have it noted. She had a Rolodex of women. She would apparently call them to just line them up for massages for Epstein. Flew hundreds of times on his private jet, the Lolita Express. And another, another person named, uh, well, well, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Now, we'll, so we've got that. Now, we have back here from Jeff Paleyuka. That's the end of our line of questioning from him. And we jump into our next witness. This witness is Nicole Hesse. Nicole Hesse, or Hess, is a Palm Beach employee. And she is being examined by Allison Moe, U.S. government prosecutor. She worked for Epstein back at the Palm Beach residence. That's what that residence looks like. That was in the original indictment, sort of his main center hub for all of his nefarious activities. She worked there in the early 2000s, talked about taking phone messages at his Palm Beach, Florida mansion when he was not home. Okay, so let's break this down. Epstein's not home. Nicole Hesse works for him. Somebody calls. She picks up the phone. Hello, this is Nicole. This is the Epstein residence. How can I help you? Somebody tells her something. She writes it down. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. Something that we might, we might have done a million times in our lives, but this is the court of law. So it's not ever simple. She says it was Galen Maxwell who instructed her on where to jot down the messages. Prosecutors also add, had her authenticate a sealed exhibit showing someone a call to the estate in August 2004 from somebody named Carolyn. The same name as one of the Maxwell's alleged victims. Ugh. Okay, so we've got two people named uh, Carolyn now. Has the same name. Somebody called in. There's a sealed exhibit showing that that person called in. So it sounds like what we're trying to do now is connect the chain. We're trying to physically connect one person to another. Epstein over to, you can see it in the mind map. We can 
And the mind map's not up to date. I don't have today's uh, stuff in it because I was preparing for the show. But you can see it's going to go from Carolyn to Matt. He would get the phone call from Sarah. Who would give him the instructions? Epstein. Epstein was in a close relationship with Maxwell, who presumably helped to recruit Sarah. So all these pieces are being connected and the government's just trying to connect the dots. Carolyn, somebody has one of the same names as one of somebody else who called that estate. Okay. Why is this a problem? I know this sounds super simple. Somebody calls in, somebody else answers the phone. Somebody says something to the person who's answering the phone. That person writes a message down. And then that message is, is submitted as evidence. And that message is supposed to be symbolizing what the person said, isn't it? But you have this game of telephone that's taking place. Sort of like when you, you, know, you see the kids in the circles and they say, uh, you know, little Johnny ate an apple. And by the time you get to the end of the circle, it's, you know, uh, Mary had 37 puppies or something. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? And it, everything gets distorted. So it becomes less reliable when you're passing a message along a number of different people. Joe Nearman, Good Logic, who has been doing amazing work covering the Galen Maxwell trial, recorded this video for us here today, giving us an update on this witness and on the problem as it exists in the law. Here is what he said today. Hey Robert, your viewers are probably familiar with the term hearsay, but few of them are likely very familiar with the concept of double hearsay. And it seems possible that members of the defense team may be a little bit unfamiliar with it as well. Allow me to explain. So during the course of this morning's testimony, one of the witnesses brought to the stand was Nicole Hesse. She served as, house as the house master in place of Juan Alessi when he quits, running the, the home down in Palm Beach. Part of her duties included that there was a message booklet which she would record who called, when they called, and messages that they, they left on various dates and times, and she would, she would sign it herself. When the state aimed to bring in some of those messages, the defense objected on the basis of hearsay. And they even properly said, pointed out that even if there's a business exception here, that it's a little bit similar to police statements that we can't really trust the initial statement. But they didn't take it any further than that, and they never used the term double hearsay. So what is double hearsay? Well, there's actually two steps of hearsay that are happening here. First, if we're tracing backwards in time, what this message book is telling us is what was recorded during the regular course of events. Now, the business exception to hearsay can knock that out. And in other words, we're looking at this message booklet and we're saying to ourselves, can we trust that what it's saying to us is accurate? And under the business exception, we say since it's a normal course of business, that there's an exception under the rules of evidence and say that that, is, that overcomes that hurdle. But it doesn't, there's a second level of hearsay here, which is the information that was received by whoever answered the phone. That information is another level of hearsay. We have no way of knowing the reliability of the people they were calling. It could be me calling and I say I'm Robert Gruller. It could be anyone calling and giving false information. And that was never really laid out by the term double hearsay to the court. And the court ended up admitting this evidence and potentially seeing as how it corroborates Carolyn's claim that she was working and servicing Epstein for a couple of years, it could end up biting the defense. Only time will tell. That's all I got, gold speed. Love you, Joe. Amazing work, amazing. So he explained that very, very beautifully and it's a complicated legal concept and it's difficult to make heads or tails of it, but to, to reiterate what he said is you've got several different things going on. So let's, let's break this down at the base level. When we have a trial and we have witnesses and, and evidence coming into the trial because we have a complicated legal thing that we need to solve a problem here, we want to make sure that the evidence, the testimony, whatever is being submitted is reliable. It's relevant, it matters here, and it's reliable. We can trust it. So there's a concept called hearsay. If it's an out-of-court statement that is being made to offer the, proof of the, uh, the truth of the matter asserted, there's all sorts of rules about that. Because it's an out-of-court statement. We would much rather prefer, because it's a lot more reliable, an in-court statement. If somebody said that X, Y, you know, a, a person X murdered person Y, it's way better if we have person 
that person who made that statement come into court and say it in court because that gives the defense the opportunity to cross-examine that person. We get to say, we get to challenge their reliability. We get to confront the accuser and say, yeah, you say this happened, but isn't it true that so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? That's what the cross-examination part of all of this is all about. So if you have out-of-court statements, the general rule is sort of, well, you don't really let those things come in. And there are exceptions to that. So for example, if you have sort of a, uh, what's called an excited utterance, if you just say something, you know, out of, out of the blue, maybe the court will consider that to be reliable and they'll let that statement in because it was an excited utterance. There's an exception for that. All sorts of different exceptions and things that are not considered to be hearsay. And, and it's a very complicated rule that a lot of attorneys really struggle with. But what Joe is talking about is layers of hearsay here. So again, we have several out of court statements. Not only do we have Hesse's written record, which she wrote the message on, which is an out of court statement. So it's coming from her mind onto a notepad. That's an out of court statement. They're saying, well, it doesn't really matter because it is a business record. She was an employee there. This is a part of her duty. So that's an exception to the hearsay rule that still makes that record reliable because it's part of her business duties. She's not inclined to lie. She takes messages all day long. So we can say that that's reliable. Even though it's an out of court statement, it's going to be reliable and we'll let that in. What Joe is talking about is even another layer. The message that she wrote down, who did that come from? The person on the phone. They're not in court either. They're not coming in to testify. You don't get to cross examine that person. And so whatever they were communicating to the employee, Hesse, is also hearsay. So that's a hearsay message that she's writing down, which is her hearsay, which is now coming into court. And apparently, Maxwell's attorneys didn't catch it. So Joe, I can't believe it. Apparently, talked to Bobby Sternheim on Galen Maxwell's team. He posted this on Twitter. Gave us an update a few hours ago. Says, when we broke for lunch, I spoke personally with Maxwell's lead defense attorney. Can you believe that? Says, find out what I advised her and why. <laughs> Amazing. So I guess if you want to know what, the, what he talked to her about, you're going to have to go over to his channel. It's tagged in the description below. Amazing channel. He, he had a great update last night doing great work. So go give Joe a follow. And he's helping Galen Maxwell. Can you believe that? He's helping a monster like her. What kind of lawyer would do that? What kind of lawyer would help criminals? What a monster. Unbelievable. In fact, well, you, you, can, still, you can still go and subscribe to Joe even though he's helping Galen Maxwell. I mean, I can't believe it. We'll talk about that later. Thank you, Joe Nearman, for the incredible update. Now, testimony continues. Let's dig into the actual transcript from Inner City Press. Here's how that testimony unfolded. Next witness. She worked at Epstein's Palm Beach residence. This was back in 2003. What was your job there, says Prosecutor Moe. Mrs. Hesse says, well, it was to take care of the home. I was hired by Galen Maxwell. She was the lady of the house, as we heard from Juan Alessi. She starts testifying. Judge gives the jurors their morning break. But we, we're back. There's another sealed exhibit. Mo asks, in this sealed exhibit you're looking at, do you see that somebody named Carolyn called Epstein's house? Yeah, I do. Now that we're looking at this sealed exhibit, it says Carolyn, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And that's all we got out of that one. So we see the connection. Somebody named Carolyn comes out. Galen Maxwell hired her. Several different people called. Sean was the boyfriend who, introduced, who made the connections from Carolyn to Sarah it's all coming together. Next witness comes out. We've got Adam Classfield tells us his name, David Rogers. This is the last witness of the day. We'll dig into him a little bit further than some of the other witnesses. He was another quote, chief pilot for Jeffrey Epstein for more than a decade, hired back in July of 1991. And we've got Maureen Comey, the daughter of ex-FBI director, James Comey. I told you she's never going to, you know, it's, it's always going to be that. In fact, she should just put a comma after her name, Maureen Comey, comma, the daughter of ex-FBI director James Comey. Just make it a fit. Put it on your business card. Just get it over with. 
Okay, so Mr. Rogers is now here. Mr. David Rogers. Mr. Rogers takes a stand. Says, who did you work for uh, until 2019? Prosecutor says, Jeffrey Epstein. As a pilot since 1999. I was hired in Columbus, Ohio. Did it for a long time. We take a look at his record. Now, this is not part of the trial record, but I, I plugged David Rogers into Google and uh, this woman's blog came up, Christine Negroni, and she dug into him a little bit and was able to pull up his FAA administration documents, posted this, counties over in Palm Beach, corrective lenses for vision, airline transport pilot, but all in all, a pretty good, you know, a good record. And she made a good point. She said, hey, you know, if all these people are being investigated for trafficking and conspiracy and all these different horrendous offenses, well, why are the people who are actually doing the trafficking, who saw all of it, why have they not been prosecuted? Why have the pilots not been indicted for actually moving the bodies from one part of the world to the other part of the world? She goes through and says, yeah, they've all got perfectly valid licenses, not even a problem at all. And so we're going to hear that a lot of this has been redacted for the purposes of the trial. But Christine Negroni was able to pull up some of these logs and she makes a couple of good points in these logs. You can see here that we have the pilot's signature. It looks like it's this guy. So he's here now. David Rogers signed off on that number of different names on here. You've got Bill Clinton, Kevin Spacey, a Columbia's former president. We've got Andres Pastrana, New York hedge fund operator, Glenn Dubin, model agency, John Luke Brunel. We saw a picture of him earlier in the show. Flights all over the place, U.S., international, hopscotched all across Europe, North Africa, and Asia. And you can see that in this document that some of these, you don't even know what the names are. One female, one female, one female. Who is it? How old? Sort of just, I don't know, kind of trafficking in females, maybe. So if this guy is doing that and he knows that, if he's seeing illegal and problematic activities on this airplane, shouldn't he do something about it? Is what some people are arguing. But he is taking the stand. Just like Visosky, he says the same thing. Maxwell's number two, just under Epstein. She is, in fact, the lady of the house. Talking about their relationship says, well, early on, they were romantically involved. But saying later, uh, they weren't. Kind of broke up. You know, all those pictures they saw, they had a falling out. Testimony continues. He now turns to the passenger manifest. What we just looked at. Most of this is all redacted. Don't see almost any of it. But he says he also kept a personal logbook. So in addition to what we saw, he's asked, What's a logbook? It just shows you the day you flew, destination you went to, basic stuff like the time and etc. So the government, of course, is talking about those logbooks that we just talked about. They enter in now a sealed and a public version of an exhibit. And so we'll probably get that exhibit tomorrow. The sealing is now being done to protect various witnesses. Rogers, again, the pilot, he continues. He describes flights all over the place. Went to Teterboro, New Jersey, Teterboro, New Jersey, presumed to be a stop for Epstein so that he could go over to the Manhattan townhouse. Inner City Press gives us a little bit more color here, says we flew mostly between his houses from 91. He had a smaller plane. Then he had a Gulfstream. Then he had a Cessna 421. Then he had a Boeing 727 upgrade. Comey says on the Gulfstream, what divider was in there? Uh, a door. Always closed, never open. And I did keep a logbook, and we're offering the logbook as an exhibit. So Inner City Report says that that logbook is actually shown on the screen, and it has an, the entire column of the passenger name redacted or blacked out. So presumably talking about this. Basically all of this. Uh, actually, we can't see any of that. Yeah, passenger name redacted. He asks the question, is there really a reasonable expectation of privacy for flying on the private jet of a pedophile? <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Prosecutor says, how would you find out the names of the passengers? Roger says, well, sometimes we'd be told. Would you always know? No, we wouldn't. As we saw, they're just listed on there as a female. You don't need to know. Write down one female. That's good enough. 
They break for lunch, long break, jury comes back in. Now, Galen Maxwell is in a red sweater. She sidled over to her lawyer's ear, whispered in her ear. Here's what that looked like. You can see her in her red outfit. Mask is off at the moment. Talking to, it might be Paleyuka, I'm not sure. It might be a U.S. Marshal behind her sitting here. We got the rest of her team, of course, in court with her. Jury finally makes it back. Prosecutor Comey picks back up and says, all right, Rogers, please turn in your binder. We've got Government Exhibit 12. Without saying the name out loud, don't say it. Is that the name of the passenger on Mr. Epstein's plane? He says yes. We go back to sealed exhibit 662. It's going to be on page 44, flight number 916 here. Uh, Mr. Rogers, who drove the passengers to the plane in Palm Beach? Oh, Juan Alessi. Remember our pal Juan, housekeeper for Epstein? So all of the different parties are now coming back. They go through the flight logs one after the other. Comey says, how about this flight? Well, that one was from Palm Beach. We went from Palm Beach to New Jersey and Jane was on that flight. Victim number one testified early on in this trial, identifying the actual trafficking. This flight, we have this date, this time, this location, on this plane, on this number. You were flying it. From Palm Beach to New Jersey, who was there? Jane, check the trafficking box. There you go. Are there others on the flight? Yeah. Okay, let's go to another flight. Who else was not disclosed? We don't know who else is on there. Big blank in the testimony. They pick back up. How about this one? Flight 818. Oh, well, that was from Van Nuys, California, over to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Only Jeffrey was on that flight. Going through one after the other, flight after flight. Finally, how many times do you remember Virginia Guffrey being on there? Virginia Roberts. How many times did she fly on that plane? Roger says 32 times. It's a lot. Another connection to Guffrey. And Comey says, well, how about this flight? This one was uh, over to St. Thomas. I have a question about this one. Was Epstein, well, were Maxwell, Epstein, and Virginia Roberts on there? Roger says, yeah. And there was one other person on that flight, right? Yes. Okay, let's move on to another flight. That additional passenger, undisclosed. Don't know who that is. Don't get to find out. Testimony continues, and you can see that they're just going through one after the other. Prosecutor says from Spain to Tangier, Morocco, list goes on and on. Guffrey there was on the plane a total of 32 times. Other people flew all over the place, and Jane was also on the flights. We learn a little bit more about these people. Some of the acquaintances that came out during this testimony, this fella, guy by the name of Glenn Dubin, he is a billionaire hedge fund manager. His wife is named Eva Anderson Dubin. Wild story on this one. If you dig into this story by Lee Brown, you can see I just clipped the headline here. Apparently, this woman, Eva Anderson, actually dated Epstein for 11 years until the early 1990s. Then you fast forward, she, you know, what, something happens, they break up. She reconnects with this guy. Glenn Dubin, hedge fund billionaire, turns out Ava's like this supermodel extraordinaire that was, you know, queen of Sweden or something. I don't know. And she dates Epstein. Epstein, they break up. Then Epstein, after she's married to this new dude, wants to marry the ex-girlfriend's teenage daughter who calls him Uncle Jeff. What? Is that his daughter? Why is she calling him Uncle Jeff? And why does he want to marry uh, the daughter of his ex? What? All right. So this dude is just like, what? I mean, he's out of his. Okay. <clears throat> so it, you can read that story if you want to. Anyways, we've got Marvin Minsky is also on this list. Uh, he also came under hot water. He's an MIT professor. Apparently, he died back in 2016, no longer around. But he was over at MIT known Epstein, Epstein associate apparently was involved with Virginia Guffrey. So, oh man, it's just, okay. So back to inner city press, let's move on. Cross-examination happens. Christian Everdell comes back out. 
sounds like he might be having a little bit of a tough time here as we wrap up the day. And he is now cross-examining the pilot. He says, all right, Mr. Rogers, sometimes the cockpit door would be open and you could see the passengers. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's correct. And you did that sometimes, right? Yeah. So you did actually open the door and you would see the passengers and all that. Right. So you testified on direct exam that it was always closed. Didn't you? I did. But that's not exactly true. It's not always closed. Right. Right. OK. Just want to clear that up. Thank you. Maxwell's lawyer says, and you never found in the cabin any toys or cucumbers or torpedoes or any sort of uh, squashes or anything like that, anything that was used, right? No, I didn't. I didn't see anything like that at all. And Maxwell's lawyer, Everdell, says, and you're a pilot. I mean, isn't it common to own private planes through companies? Yeah. And it's kind of like a one company per plane to limit liability also, right? Yeah. They go on a break. Judge sends them on their afternoon break. And we come back. Classfield gives us a different side of the story, says that Epstein's ex-chief pilot Rogers is now back on the stand. Like Epstein's other pilot, Rogers says, never saw any problematic activity and also never even saw anyone who appeared to be unaccompanied minors. Didn't see it. Goes back through his logbook, says, yeah, Virginia Roberts was on there 32 times. Jane was on there also including on the flights to the airport. And where'd they go? Oh, Interlochen Art School over in Michigan. Learned a lot about that place. This is the same academy that Jane says that she met Epstein and Maxwell. So all the pieces are now coming together. Maxwell's lawyer says to Rogers, hmm, uh, Mr. Rogers, you know the real name of Jane, don't you? Judge Nathan says, careful, without saying it. Roger says, yes, I do. And Everdell says, hmm, but didn't Epstein also have an assistant with the same first name as Jane's real first name, though, didn't he? And Roger says, yes. This is another way of outing or doxing is what he says. Uh-oh. What's going on here? Well, this would be very confusing. Fortunately, we have a mind map we can take a look at and sort of break this down here. So we've got, he is now talking about Jane. And in this conversation about Jane, which is the first name victim, she's apparently on this airplane. Pilot number two says, I flew her all over the place. Jane has a actual real first name. Okay, we know what the first name is. If you take a look, if you look on the internet, you can find it in two seconds. It's everywhere. We know what the real first name is. We also know that Epstein had another assistant with the same first name. We heard previously from Carolyn's boyfriend that one of Epstein's assistants was Sarah Kellen. These are the named co-conspirators. So there's probably a pretty high likelihood that one of these ladies here has the same name as Jane. Which she does. And so once again, you're seeing how the jurors are, are going to get a lot of details about this. We're being told, oh, they don't, they can't see anything. They don't know anything. They are getting a lot of details about this. And this is just sort of being allowed to fly. Recall yesterday that Paleyuka said the last name of Carolyn in court. And on, I think, day one or two, when he was doing the, the cross-examination of Jane, he actually said her name in court. So the jurors are getting a lot more than even we're getting. Uh, they're, uh, obviously, obviously, they're getting a lot more than we're getting. But they're being, we're being told that everything is highly redacted. And that, you know, they're actually, all of these pseudonyms and things like that, it's just a nice little facade. A lot more data is leaking through to the jurors than uh, maybe the court would be inclined to uh, admit. So you can see the different connections here. Jane is now 
somebody that we know from testimony today that has the same name as somebody who is one of the or, or, or another one of Jeffrey Epstein's assistants, probably one of these people. And it turns out that that is true. So we see that Everdell continues. OK, and Eva Dubbin over here. The woman that Epstein wants to marry, the woman that, Ep that Epstein dated, but now wants to marry her daughter, Ava was on that flight. And her husband, he's a hedge fund manager, right? He was actually an Epstein client, wasn't he? Roger says, I don't know. Everdell continues his cross and says, okay, so these trips to Columbus, Ohio, that's where Leslie Wexner lives, right? The owner of The Limited. And I think that's the same guy from sort of Victoria's Secret. Roger says, uh, yeah, it is. And Mr. Wexner is a billionaire, isn't he? Jeffrey Epstein's client. Yeah, Roger says, yeah, he is. And Everdell continues. And finally, we get to Annie Farmer, who presumably is going to be our last victim that we're going to hear from tomorrow. Inner City Press says, and you never saw any farmer in your planes or your logs, did you? No, I did not. And after a time, I thought it was, uh, Everdell says, he, he sort of chimes in. Oh, I thought it was later than it is. Judge Nathan says, no, it just feels that way. This is dragging on forever. Ugh. But the point here is Everdell says, you never saw any farmer on your planes or your logs, did you? So we have Jane that we get from this testimony, but... Nothing about Kate, very little about Carolyn. Testimony wraps up. Maxwell's lawyer, Everdell, says, okay, now Mr. Visosky. Uh-oh, that's not who's testifying. It's Mr. Rogers. Judge Nathan corrects him. It's not Mr. Visosky. It's Mr. Rogers. Everdell sets out an uncomfortable laugh. We see this fellow again. He comes right back out. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. And so we start to wrap up testimony. That's the end of it for David Rogers. And we get some scheduling orders here. Now, this is very curious. What's going on here? At the very end of the day, Inner City Press report says, Judge Nathan says, I would prefer not to do the charging conference on Friday. In other words, in nine days. In case you don't have a case going on that day, given the expedition, maybe we can use Friday for charging. They're talking scheduling. Nathan says, uh, I'm comfortable letting the defense begin its case on Thursday. That's in eight days, one week from tomorrow. The result may be that the jury has this Friday off as well. So in other words, so I, it's hard to tell what's going to happen with the, with the schedule. I don't know. Prosecutors still have one more accuser to call, they say and may rest their case as soon as tomorrow, which is what the New York Post is reporting. But over here, it sounds like it's not going to be, they're, they're not going to rest or start the defense until next day. So don't really know. Now, this is a very curious thing that's happening here. Why is the government accelerating their case? We, we heard that this was going to be a six-week case. And it sounds like they're sort of cutting off a lot of their testimony. They're consolidating their case. And the, the question that I had, of course, was why? Why would they be making this late minute change, last minute change? And I think the obvious answer is because of those rulings that the court gave in terms of the victims. Remember that we talked about this at the start of the show when we were talking about the different victims here, the different witnesses. We've got a, an instruction from the judge that says specifically about Kate, not a victim of the crimes charged. The judge said that specifically. Okay, so if they can't, if, if, if she's not a victim of the crimes charged that are in the indictment, there's not much that, that they need her to testify about. Her testimony is basically a whole lot less relevant because she's not a minor anymore. And the court found that. So Maxwell, you know, as far as I can tell, is basically not guilty of any of these charges unless I have this, you know, unless I'm reading this wrong. Same type of situation with Annie Farmer. If Annie Farmer's case is now only limited to the conspiracy and to the grooming because she was actually over the age of consent when this was taking place according to New Mexico law, then she's sort of like a half victim. And so now we have two victims that we're working with. Carolyn, who is not that great of a victim, schizophrenia, methadone, opioid addict, all sorts of money-seeking behaviors. The defense has already beat her up pretty badly. And Jane didn't testify all that well either. And we know that Jane 
had some problems with calling uh, Laura Menninger from the defense a front. And there was a whole series of I don't recalls from Jane as well. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. We talked about that on day one. So you can see what the defense is doing. They're just sort of, you know, uh, whittling away at each one of these victims. And if they can't consider Kate to be a full victim, if they can't consider Annie to be a full victim, well, their testimony gets narrowed down considerably pretty quickly. And so maybe they don't need to talk about all that stuff. All the people who are going to come in and, you know, they've got sort of a mind map of their own going on. Everybody else. Oh, we've got Rebecca and Richard here. They're poking around looking at the mind map. Reading some of the notes on Kate. You're on YouTube. <laughs> Be careful. So, um, so take a look at the mind map. There's a lot more data that's in there that is uh, available for you if you want to browse around at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Let's see what you have to say about trial in day eight for Glenn Maxwell from our friends over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We had some super chats come in here at the start of the show. Janet Hunt says, Maxwell Trial Tracker Twitter account is suspended. I saw that. I don't really know what that was all about. You know, I was following them. You know, I'm not somebody to, sh to throw shade on any anybody else, but it, it wasn't giving a whole lot of good new information as some of the other accounts were. So I'm not real sure, you know, that that's a huge loss as far as I can tell. But, uh, but yeah, interesting. You know, I don't know what they did. I don't know if they were, there was sort of a series of accounts that got banned. There are a lot of sort of, you know, anyways, good luck to them. Janet Hunt is here. Says, my first thought of Maxwell's looks are, she looks like a rhymes with bunt, a whole bunt cake or something that rhymes with front. As Jane said, when she was talking to her brother on a prior day marzi panna with no question but a nice donation thank you marzi and then we have dr emb is in the house with a very generous donation as always doctor you make my skin turn red fantastic job as usual team much appreciated and thank you well thank you dr emb very very nice very generous and let's see what our friends at locals have to say over at watching the watchers dot locals dot com have to uh change this screen here and here we go here we go equestrian girl is here says and and welcome equestrian girl i saw you just signed up grateful you're here rob so i'm curious with you being a defense attorney how do you think the defense is going to play this trial after the prosecution is done and their witness since they said they'll be done this week i'm curious if they're going to make elaine look like a victim or how you think this is going to happen do you think they're going to put her on the stand no i don't think that they're going to put her on the stand that would be not good. I don't think that we're going to see that at all. Uh, and I think it's going to be what we were talking about earlier, Equestrian Girl, villain versus victim. It's going to be the government's job to make it her look like the villain. She was the mastermind. She was the person, the brains behind this operation. And it was a lot more her fault than the defense would like you to believe. They want to make you think that this is all just a big, she's a victim, not the villain. And I think we'll see that theme continue to evolve. Monster One says, 601 start time. Tardiness is unacceptable. Please report to the principal Epstein's office for discipline. Oh, I'd rather just jump out the window, which I probably would do. Thomas Binger says, Kyle, when Rosenbaum chased, did he have a plastic cucumber? Did he have a cylindrical object? Did he have a twin torpedo? Did he have a triple torpedo? Did he have, and the list goes on and on, poor Thomas Binger. wonder what he's up to these days. King Cade says, Rob, greetings and all. The accused in treatment. The plain side of me wants to agree with Maxwell's brother regarding restraints and other concerns. However, the frosty side says, hell, shortcut it and strap her to the chair with intravenous something. Ooh, seriously, though, your opinions are honorable and should be enforced. Even after imprisonment and guilt, justice should not be cruel. Perhaps looking at how Norway's handle crime should be reviewed. Her truth should be uncensored and direct. Let the shadows fall. Thank you for all the hard work and time. You are a force of positivity. Well, thank you, Kincaid. I think that about you. We have Melinda says, Billy took the photos. He always loves pressing buttons. Bill Gates was on there. Sick. Well, probably true. He has Vienti kisses here says let's uh rob press the right buttons there it is 
says the trial tracker account, tracker account hasn't been mentioned. It's a Twitter account that was reporting updates on the case. It's been suspended. Hambly from the quartering did some research, made a video. There are a lot of fake accounts claiming to be the same thing. I know the legal process is supposed to operate only on information that's relevant, that's presented in the courtroom, but there's so much blatant covering up around this whole situation. Even operating under the, that premise, you have to ask yourself, what happens if both sides are really the same side? In the end, no one is an island. There is no such thing as a completely isolated system. The idea of keeping things out is only ever going to be as strong as the opposing forces opposing it are weak. As much as the idea of keeping the jury, jury's knowledge isolated is ideal in many situations, I think the reality is that becomes detrimental in others. Just want to throw that out there, get your thoughts and responses to that. Even with all that, when it comes to the idea that this trial is completely on the up and up, I press X to doubt. So yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't like anything that is not open and uh, transparent. I mean, trials like this where almost every stinking thing is under seal and this, this is a very special circumstance, right? These are, these are, this is a multi-million dollar defense. This is a multi-million dollar prosecution. It is a multi-million dollar investigation. This is, this is a trial that is uncommon, right? I mean, even with other cases, you can call in and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I have a problem with it, Vianticus. I mean, I think it's just, it's a little bit too closed down for my liking more. You know, and I understand having to balance the pros and cons of privacy and due process and a, and a fair trial. But I also think that if you balance it, you know, if you balance the factors in this case, it, this is way too closed down for my liking. Vientica says, I don't think Epstein is taking the second foot photo. Looks like it's being taken from a perspective of the seat that's empty in the first photo. That's from Vientica with another perspective. Thank you. My friend, a soul Viking is here, says great emoji for Jeffrey's feet in her rack. Nice work, Rob. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, thanks. I, I thought it was appropriate. Rad says, hey, I saw that mind map on CNN. Good work, Robert. <laughs> well, uh, hey, look, as, as long as Chris Cuomo didn't take it. Oh, wait, he can't. Oh, Georgia Peaches says, hey, Rob, love the way you read with attitude. When looking at some of the photos on his plane, someone else doesn't need to be there. I think she used a timer on her phone. In one of the photos, it appeared Epstein was napping. LOL, bet there were some sweet and maybe sour dreams going on in that pig's head. That's from Georgia Peaches. Good to see you, Georgia. Thanks for being here for that nice comment. We have another one. Sorry, this is off topic, but Rittenhouse was on Louder with Crowder this morning. What a, what a nice kid. Thanks, buddy. I haven't listened to that, but somebody from my office told me about that, so I'm going to have to listen to that maybe tonight. Buttered Toast says, nice to know how the other side lives. I guess when you're rich and make it to the top, it isn't about making humanity better, but just having as much uh, you know, intercourse with you can excuse me while I slave away. Well, it's better than what they're doing. At least you won't burn in hell for all eternity. So sleep well at night. Vienticus says, good logic is in the chat. You should probably make him a mod so he can see his chats more easily. Oh, is he here still? Where's he at? Where's the good logic of Joe? All right, I'm going to keep my eye out. If I see him, will wrench him up. Is that a thing? Is that, is that a good, proper YouTube etiquette? Still learning on all this stuff. We have Sergeant Bob is here, says incredibly complex case. Good job, sir. I'm ready to take the LSAT again. Well, I wouldn't wish that LSAT on anybody. I hated that stinking test. It's frustrating as heck. When you like to be like a, like a 100% type of a thing, you can't really do that on the LSAT. It's frustrating. Thunder seven says, I think the state wants to shut down the trial quickly to avoid the publicity with the Clintons and the Maxwell Epstein saga. Even though they keep throwing out Trump's name, he hasn't had any contact with either of them in decades, but the Clintons and Gates and Andrew, Prince Andrew, they all kept in contact with them. Even after Epstein was charged and given a level three risk, the new boss at Twitter shutting down any accounts, which have photo photos docks with the Clinton royalty Epstein Maxwell connection. The truth will come out after the trial ends. Well, I sure hope so, Thunder7. We're going to continue to do our part to report on it and connect all the dots, and I'm grateful for your input. Jeremy says, Rob, I know I've said this before, but I love the work you have done making the mind map. Visual aids are extremely helpful in understanding how things are related. Have you ever considered studying social network analysis? I'm thinking you might dig so deep in connecting the dots that you might be called to testify. I, that's funny, Jeremy. Uh, oh no, what did I just do? Okay. So, uh, no, I have not, I have not taken up, uh, a hobby in social network analysis, but 
maybe, maybe one day I'll do it. Thank you for the comment, Jeremy. I'm glad you're enjoying the mind maps. I'll tell you this. I actually have a lot of fun making them. Once you start a tentacle in the mind map, it's really hard to like not keep adding to it. It feels like, it almost feels like a, uh, like a video game, like an MMO or something where you have to go and collect the resources and build it and add a little branch. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Speech Unleashed says, I know that good logic is not a reporter, but I honestly have an issue with him interjecting himself into the actual court case by talking, advising directly either the defense or the prosecution. When that happens, it gives the appearance of him trying to become a part of the story or the trial instead of just being an observer or a commentator. Interesting perspective there, speech. Interesting perspective, you know, and I, and I think that Joe is, you know, is in an interesting sort of position where we all, we all are actually kind of, you know, like I would, I would say that those old lines are no longer as relevant as they used to be, you know, reporters and journalists and uh, biased and unbiased and all of that stuff. I mean, the, the sort of idyllic image that any journalist or any reporter anywhere is going to be unbiased. I think, I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. I mean, there's still that, that sort of, you know, fake notion that that exists, but I think practically I'm not sure that there's anybody out there who's reporting that is, you know, unbiased really. And so I think what Joe's doing is he's, he's observing, he's reporting, he's participating, you know, speech. I talk about this sort of in, in my book, talking about the idea that a big part of the problem with law is that not enough people are interested in the law. If more people are interested in the law and we don't just treat people like bags of dirt and garbage and just say, well, the justice system has them, so we can just forget about them. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We're just going to, eh, I guess, move on to the next thing and turn back on the Kardashians because the legal system will just take care of itself. Who cares what's happening to the prisoners? Who cares about violations of due process? Who cares if you have a corrupt and just d d d uh, disgusting prosecution or, or prosecutor's office? Who cares what the police are doing? None of our business. I think what Joe and what a lot of these other law tubers are doing and the people who are really, you know, talking about these cases, commenting on the case, I think that they're bringing attention to these very, very important issues. They're bringing people, they're, cause, they're cre helping to create interest in something that needs more eyeballs on it. And so I understand your perspective, but I think, I think we're sort of just coming out into a new paradigm. I just don't think that we're going to be sort of coloring within those old lines anymore. You know, guys like Joe... Uh, you know, part of the work that I'm doing that Ricade is doing, you know, if, if I'm covering a story, you know, and, and somebody finds something useful or helpful as, as, as a result of one of my ideas or something, and they use that, it's great. That's great. That's great. Right. It's part of, it's part of the legal process and the legal conversation. And so I don't think that good logic or Joe has ever, uh, has ever tried to portray himself as an unbiased reporter or anything like that. You know, he's a YouTuber, he's a lawyer. He is somebody who is reporting on these things at the moment, but he's also somebody who is, you know, an advocate. He wants to see the justice system function and work well. He wants to see, you know, an, an improvement in society. And uh, I think he's doing a great job with that. So I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that speech. Hopefully, hopefully Joe, you know, understands where you're going with that, but uh, Love the different perspectives. Sasha Sisha says, hey, Rob, hope you and the fam are doing well. It seems that Epstein is in trial rather than Galen. Not sure how this is going to play out with the jury. Yeah, basically every day talking about Epstein, one after the other. Isn't it interesting? And uh, they're going to have to make the decision about her, about Galen. All of the jury instructions are going to be about her, not Epstein. Sergeant Bob says... Miss Lucky's son flew as a commercial pilot for a very wealthy BC businessman prior to the virus. Pilots were not even supposed to talk to the boss or the passengers. Their job, only to fly. So any knowledge would be somewhat speculative. Passengers might be noted as a safety item. That's it. Sort of like Juan Alessi. Don't you even talk to Mr. Epstein. Don't have any bul anything bulging out of your pants. Because this is Epstein's house and only he can bulge here. Juan John, resident of Make Believe, says the OG Rogers would pop a can of whoop on that imposter. Yeah, Mr. Rogers would not stand for any of this stuff. Mr. Rogers would say, I feel some evil, nefarious activities happening around here. Let's put on our shoes. Mama Goob says, you know what I find weird about all the redaction and the assumed victims' names? That most of this was fully discussed in the Netflix documentary about Epstein. 
I believe that Caroline and Jane's stories were covered in full with their real faces and names. I wonder if the jurors were asked if they watched it. <laughs> this is from Mama Goob. It's a good question. It's a good comment, Mama Goob. Kind of feels like it's a lot of... Uh, Uh, I can't think of the word. I was going to think of a word, but I'm not going to say that word. Leafy Bug says, I just thought I'd stop by to spread the word that Natalie Wisco, the Millibytes lawyer, is on uh, on the Rittenhouse defense, was on Legal Bites channel. Very interesting insider account of the trial, including the reasons why they made the decisions they did, why they spent so little time on jury selections, why they didn't object more, why Kyle testified, why they sought a mistrial. In short, they had constant eyes on the jury. They could see what was landing and what wasn't. They saw how the jury was reacting. They knew the judge. They were Kenosha-specific factors in play. One could say she was covering for her boss, but her rationale seemed pretty plausible. I found them and her convincing. I'm mentioning this because I recall you being a lot less critical of Richards and co. than others, and that the defense's strategy would have been based on the work for a Kenosha jury. After listening to Wisco, I think your analysis has been vindicated. I completely recommend people catch this interview if they haven't already, as it gives the most detailed and credible insight into what was going on during the trial that's currently out there. Thank you for that ping, Leafy Bug. Yeah, and that was the feel, you know, it's sort of, they were, they were sort of uh, calling audibles as they were walking up to the line of scrimmage in real time. And what that felt like to a lot of people was sloppiness and sort of like haphazard and, but they were, they were watching and observing and making adjustments. And I know lawyers like that. There's appropriate times to be, you know, to be practicing that way. And it worked out for them. So how can you be critical? They got a complete victory across the board. Congratulations, Natalie. We've got Thunder7 says, enjoying your daily trial updates, Rob. Quick question. Full passenger name must be noted in the flight log in the case of a crash. How can they get away with writing female so nobody will ever know they go missing? Well, I think when you're a billionaire and you have your private plane and nobody cares what you do, that's the least of your worries. Thunder7, you're adorable. They're trafficking 14-year-old girls around the country and world but they didn't update their flight log. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you, Thunder7. It's a great point. It's just hilarious. The really dark stuff went on in the temple at the island. Hint, there was an owl sculpture atop the temple, like in Bohemian Grove. Lex Wessner just stepped down as the CEO at the beginning of trial. It's funny. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, they, they just don't, they do whatever they want. I mean, that's, that's the answer. I'm not trying to be, you know, overly jokey about it, but that's the answer. Yeah, they don't care about the flight log. What do they care? Outnumbered mom says, you just outed me to the husband for being on the mind map. He wasn't expecting to hear his name on the stream. Love the map, outnumbered mom. <laughs> Sorry about that. Forewarning, if you're going to be browsing the map while I'm recording the show, your name might pop up there and you might be on YouTube. So hopefully you're okay with that. <laughs> Shout out to Outnumbered Mom. DG McBride is here, says, Hey, Rob, how did the SDNY get around the circa 2007 or 2008 non-prosecution agreement? Was that addressed by the pretrial motion? It was, in fact, yeah. Either way, wouldn't it be something to throw up against the wall if Maxwell is convicted and has to appeal. You're exactly right, DG McBride. And in fact, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that this is probably going to be the way that this thing goes. If I have to make a prediction, you know, I think she's probably convicted and then acquitted, or I'm sorry, uh, reversed on appeal. That's my, that's my long shot, long putt. Let's see if that one goes in. Convicted and then acquitted or, or reversed on appeal. Why? Why do I say that? Well, it's because of that non-prosecution agreement that DG McBride is talking about. It's a very astute point. And guess what? We have that in the mind map. Let's take a look at it. So you'll notice that when we zoom out on this puppy, I actually have this notated in the issues. So here we have this motion to dismiss concept. Okay. The, 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 now I, I actually don't think I attached the motion to dismiss, but this was brought up in pretrial proceedings. The judge denied this. Galen Maxwell's lawyers, they filed a motion to dismiss and they said that she should be included in this non-prosecution agreement. You can see this took place back in 2007. There were four named co-conspirators in here, but DG McBride, if you look at this non-prosecution agreement, and you zoom in on this thing, you'll, you'll notice it says this as well. It says, United States also agrees that it will not institute any criminal charges against any potential co-conspirators of Epstein, including but not limited to Sarah Kellen, Adriana Ross, Leslie Groff, and Nadia Marcinkova. Okay, those were the names of everybody who was included. They cannot be prosecuted. These are people who were potential co-conspirators specifically named. But this document, 
It doesn't just limit it to them. And I've never seen anything like this, right? It's the U.S. government is not going to institute any criminal charges against any potential co-conspirators of Epstein. How does that not include Galen Maxwell? Including but not limited to, which means that this hula hoop, this circle, it's way bigger than Ross, Groff, Marcinkova, or Kellen. The U.S. government in their lunacy, I don't know why, I don't know how this came about, where they give Epstein a blank slate, a non-prosecution agreement that is a blank check. It's you, it's your four compadres, and it's any other potential people who were criminals with you. Total immunity. Something happens with Epstein, apparently he kills himself or something. But this non-prosecution agreement doesn't apply to Maxwell? Give me a break. Judge said that it didn't. But we'll see what the Court of Appeals says if she is convicted. So that's a great question. It's a great answer. I think it's going to be a juicy one that comes back up on appeal, and we'll see how that lays out. Former LEO says, I wonder if there are any photos of Epstein vacationing with his victims like he did with Maxwell. It's a great question there, former LEO. This guy's a pervert, and he's sleeping around with all these people. Is he dragging them around to beaches and stuff? Or is he only keeping them and these activities limited to the massage rooms. Matrita is here, says, all right, Rob, in aviation, when it comes to recording keeping requirements for multi-engine aircraft, each certificate holder is responsible for accuracy. Number of passengers, total weight, identification of crew members, origin and destination. This is likely the reason there isn't a complete record of the names on Epstein's aircraft. Although we can speculate someone may have recorded names they had the time or the desire to do so. Very interesting. Thank you for that citation. C. Rose is here. How do you hate the LSAT when you've written the bar exam twice? Not to mention all the law school exams in between. Have you gotten a hold of Rittenhouse to warn him about law school? <laughs> I haven't, have not yet, no. No, haven't, haven't had a connection with uh, Kyle out there. But uh, the LSAT, you have to take once. Bar exam, I've taken twice. I'd probably rather take the bar exam than the LSAT. Because it's at least interesting. Although the LSAT is interesting too. It's like a, it's like a complex puzzle. But it's, it's frustrating. If you're, uh, you know, not an, not an Oxford person. I'm not an Oxford person. So maybe if I was as, as smart as Jake Sullivan, who went to Oxford, maybe I'd like them better. Kincaid says, if you worked at CNN, that tab would have been saucy indeed. If I did, yeah, it would have been. All right, my friends, and that was it. Those were all the questions over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And I think, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that's what we've got for today. And so before we get out of here, I want to thank all of you who submitted those great questions, all of our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Before we leave, reminder that we've got a monthly meetup taking place this Saturday, folks. Three days from now, December 11th, 7 o'clock Eastern time, which means that's going to be 5 o'clock Arizona time. So it's going to be 4 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. East Coast. This Saturday, we're going to hang out for an hour, maybe two hours. It's going to be the ugly sweater edition. And we just talk. It's a lot of fun. We just talk. Raise your hand in Zoom. Cameras on, cameras off. You can use a pseudonym. If your camera's off, you might be an FBI agent. If you use a pseudonym, you might be a Galen Maxwell victim. I don't know. I won't make a mind map about it to try to figure it out. Come and join us. We'll have a lot of fun. We'll have a good conversation. We've got a lot of people doing cool stuff out there in our community. And that's what it's about. It's about community. As this society feels like it keeps drifting far and further and further apart, we're trying to bring it back together. So join us this Saturday at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And I want to welcome some amazing new supporters over there. Big final shout outs to Equestrian Girl. Welcome Equestrian Girl. We've got Richie DC in the house. We've got Red Jersey. We've got Nikki Dragon. We've got Things and Stuff joined up. Donna 107, The Vez one. We've got Jimmy W. We have Big Tother Bites. We've got Kimmy Cat 03. Kevin AZ is here. Antar 24. Queen of Tennessee. Welcome aboard. Rebley Lee. Music Box Lady. Bigree. 
is here. Tester 16T, we've got Llama Brad, Kenny HCFC, Starfish 55, Aldo the Apache, Kerry C, Gino Scrijab, Rugger Bugger, all on page one on page two. We're not done yet. We've got J Markey, Cantonese, Brody Sun, Squirrel, Ono 5 P Palin, Phantasmagoria, Black Cat Meow, Nick McLeod, Dr. Bren, T. Blakemore, Patriot Minute. We got Ben Tomlinson, Laurel 720, Unsheathed, Tucker Greb, Tommy Nukes, Redbeard, and Monique Nicole. And that, my friends, is it for us for the day. I want to thank you for being a part of the show. We're going to do it all again here tomorrow. And I need you here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency and justice down upon our system. I'll see you here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. Be well, my friends. See you then. Bye-bye.